symposium called 2013 series. We have really a very great series of speakers lined up for you for the rest of the semester. So hopefully you will all be able to join us every Thursday. How many of you are coming here for the first time? Okay, so we hold these, <laughs> we hold these every Thursday from 5.15 to 6.15, and about 20 minutes or 30 minutes before that, we also have the cookies, water, soda, coffee, and so on, so you can come and, and chat with other students or other faculty staff who are, who are around. So it's, it's kind of a snack slash networking uh, period right before the talk start. Next week, we will have the Student Research Showcase, which is a once a semester event where we have three graduate students come in and talk about their cutting edge research on different aspects of energy. Uh, in the past, we have had these talks have been very successful and they have catalyzed a lot of uh, great interactions. And I've known students who have actually gone after, or gotten motivated after the talks and have actually started their uh, uh, own research. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeffrey Alexander. He is the Associate Director for Research and Analytics for this, at the Center of, for Science, Technology, and Economic Development at SRI International. He will talk a little bit more about what SRI does. Over, he has over 20 years of experience analyzing and studying government policies' impact on science, research, technology development, venture creation, and industrial competitiveness. He really you know, has an extreme breadth of experience in different, managing different types of projects for large uh, federal agencies, and right now he, he's leading, leading several large projects, including from IARPA, which is the information version of the uh, DARPA, the defense uh, 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 project, the large agency. He also manages large projects from DOE, from NSF. His publications have appeared in very reputed journals, including Research Policy, Journal of Technology, Transfer, and also Technovation. He has a PhD from the George Washington University School of Business in Management of Science, Technology, and Innovation. He also holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from Stanford University, which is where I also went to I school. So <laughs> glad to have you here. Uh, Jeff, he'll talk about uh, energy innovation and basically how uh, different aspects, different factors come into framing of different policy aspects that impact energy uh, innovation. So we're really glad to have you here, Jeff. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, everybody's able to hear me all right? I tend to project pretty well, so hopefully that'll continue. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give a, a talk uh, probably for about 30 minutes or so. Um, I'm actually very happy to take questions during the talk, but uh, if you'd rather just for the flow of things keep your questions till the end, that's fine as well. Um, so as uh, Varun said, I'm here from um, SRI, which is not an um, acronym that's known to, to a lot of people, so I would, thought I should start with maybe a, a short commercial. I promise it will not be very long, but just to give you an introduction of where I'm from and the kind of work that we do. So SRI actually is a nonprofit uh, research institute. Uh, we do contract research primarily for the federal government. Um, it was actually formerly the Stanford Research Institute, so that's why it's SRI. And we spun off and were legally separated from Stanford in the 1970s. Um, to actually, to be honest, it was where all of the classified military research was being done at Stanford after World War II. And during the Vietnam War, that got a little bit unpopular, so they decided to disassociate themselves from us. Uh, so um, we also actually have uh, integrated the, um, the old RCA television a company, Central Research Lab, the Sarnoff Lab, so we do a lot of work in video processing and video technology. Um, and we have a number of locations around the world. Uh, our main campus is in Menlo Park, uh, right near the Stanford campus. And really our, our mission is to do science and technology research that's applied to national and social needs. So we're a little bit different from your typical kind of basic fundamental research laboratory because we really try to think about what are the uses for this technology that are going to be beneficial um, from the beginning of every project. So to give you some examples of these projects, anybody recognize this? This is, in fact, the first computer mouse. Uh, you will actually see it in the um, Museum of, uh, National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was invented by an SRI um, scientist, Doug Engelbart, who actually passed away quite recently. Um, I'd like to bring this up because it's interesting that you know, the mouse was invented in 67. It wasn't really used until the Macintosh, the Apple Macintosh, was produced in 1984. 
and we actually just sold the patent outright to Apple for you know really almost no money because everybody figured, ah, what's it good for, right? Nobody's using this thing. Um, so to me, that kind of indicates that innovation really only happens when people recognize an application tied to a technology, right? The value comes from how it's used, how it's integrated in a system, not just that you created something new. Um, the other innovation we were involved in was the internet. So we were the recipient of the very first transmission of what became the internet um, back in 1969. Uh, when I tell a lot of people that the internet was invented more than 40 years ago, they don't tend to believe me, but that's actually the lab notebook there in the uh, lower corner. Um, it's also instructive because the very first transmission, as noted in the lab notebook, was a, uh, an error code. It failed to connect. So that, to me, kind of shows that even great innovations start with things that don't always work quite right, and you have to be persistent about it. Uh, so we have quite a number of other areas where we've done um, technology development in robotics, in speech recognition, natural language processing, uh, cybersecurity, biology, um, physical sciences. So we have quite a, a, a range of areas. And what we tend to do, because we're very application-oriented, even though we're generally doing this research for an agency like the Defense Department, often there's a commercial uh, use that we can find for the same technology, so we create companies. So it's, since we're a nonprofit and we're a research group, we tend to want to do just research. If we find a technology with commercial value, we'll actually just create a company around it, spin it out of our organization, have venture capitalists come in from Silicon Valley and invest their money so that we don't have all the risk of trying to build that company, and then, uh, in the best cases, take it public. Uh, you'll notice one of the uh, highlights, I don't know if this pointer is working, uh, in the middle there is Siri, which um, is now kind of so maligned, but it's your iPhone application. It's called Siri because it came from SRI. It was actually a product of a very long-term DARPA artificial intelligence project um, that ended up we married it with cell phone search uh, as an application, and it became uh, quite successful, and Apple decided to, to buy it up. So that's kind of an indication of the kind of work that, that we do. So uh, I'm a little bit unusual within SRI because I'm in a research center that's based entirely in Washington, D.C., not in Menlo Park. Um, and our focus is on science and innovation policy and a lot of uh, issues on how do you actually extract economic value at a regional or national level from science and technology, um, which is you know, something that's actually not very easy to explain or to, um, in fact, model. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about why the policy world has so much difficulty in figuring out how to write good policy that will um, help facilitate innovation. And there's a lot of problems in the way that policy is done and the way politics works, especially in Washington, D.C., that actually is probably going to always prevent good innovation policy from ever being um, enacted, um, which has a lot of implications for, for energy innovation. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about, in the social sciences field, what we've done to try to come up with better models that can help guide better policy. And then I'll talk about a research project that I'm doing, as uh, I've already mentioned, uh, from the Department of Energy, where we're applying text analytics um, to the um, photovoltaic technologies uh, studying the development of photovoltaics in different um, areas to try to accelerate the innovation in, in solar technology. Um, and I'll preface that by saying I'm not a computer scientist. I'm going to be somewhat technical in my discussion, but just enough to kind of make sure I'm not being wrong. And if you have more questions, let me know after the fact, and I can refer you to the real computer scientists I work with who know this stuff. So... Looking at innovation policy and how it works in Washington, uh, this is actually one of my favorite quotes from John von Neumann, the, uh, the computer scientist, who said, you know, there's no point in being precise if you don't even know what you're talking about. And Washington is full of people who speak with great authority and precision about things that they know nothing about. And innovation happens to be one of those topics. Um, there's a lot of talk about we want to promote innovation, we want to have a great innovate, innovative nation, um, but without ever really trying to think about what does that mean and what is innovation in general. Now, in the social sciences, when we study innovation, uh, one thing you have to do is start unpacking the term and realize that it's used in different ways. So innovation is a noun, it's a thing, right? We talk about an innovation, which is defined as something, a, a concept, an idea, a practice that is perceived as new by an individual or some other unit of adoption like a company or a nation or an economy, right? That perceived as new is important because a lot of innovations, again, aren't actually new. They are just being used in new ways or they're imported from another domain or another, you know, geography. And so that becomes the innovation. 
uh, even though it's not necessarily something that's invented uh, at that point in time. Um, but another key point is that it's often viewed as this kind of exogenous force, right? Innovations kind of happen. They, they come up into our economy. They automate jobs. They re, you know, disrupt markets. They do all kinds of things. It's kind of like they're just, you know, uh, delivered to us from on high, um, which is really kind of a, a, a misperception uh, because innovations are, in fact, the result of a process of innovation, right? So you're trying to create an innovation. It usually means that you have, again, a practical outcome or application in mind. And when we study innovation, we're studying the entire activities from research, invention, all the way through to commercialization and uh, marketing the product, right? And all of those things require collaboration among many different kinds of individuals who can take an idea and turn it into a product or service. So innovation is, in fact, inherently social. So the problem that we have, though, is that it's a very complex process to talk about this social interaction that results in innovation, whereas the predominant metaphor in Washington is about what we call the innovation pipeline or the STEM pipeline or the science pipeline, right? You've seen this a lot. So this is kind of the traditional idea of how innovation happens. It was actually um, kind of promulgated by um, Vannevar Bush, who was... President Truman's science advisor after World War II, basically says, you start with research, you develop that idea into something useful, you design it into a product, and then you go ahead and manufacture it, right? Seems pretty straightforward and seems pretty reasonable. A lot of stuff does follow this pattern to some extent. Um, the problem that we have in Washington is that metaphors uh, in political terms tend to dominate decision making. And we actually frame what decisions we have available to us by the metaphors we choose to describe that. Because we're talking about innovation as a pipeline, we automatically assume that if I just put more in the front end, boom, I get more in the back end, right? And that's why we hear all the things that are being measured in Washington about innovation are, well, how much are we spending on R&D compared to other countries? How many more scientists and engineers do we have? How many computer science majors are there coming out, right? These are all inputs to the system. And all we have in DC right now as management tools and policy are just increase the inputs and somehow magically the outputs will manifest themselves and we'll get benefits, right? So my whole, uh, my whole kind of uh, line of uh, research is looking at, well, what is this process? How do you actually get, you know, more and better things out the back end? And also, um, how do you actually manage that process and make sure that what you're getting has actual beneficial value and isn't wasted? So social scientists have tried to come up with better models in the pipeline. This one came out in the mid-'80s from Nate Rosenberg at Stanford. You see it's very detailed. There's a lot of feedback loops. There's this interplay between you know, research that creates knowledge and is applied in different ways. Problem is, try to explain this to a congressman. Not going to go anywhere, right? Even worse is the more recent model, which is talking Generally, this is what it looks like in large corporations where you've got the firm's knowledge interacting with the knowledge base of the scientific community, and it's built into platforms, and you have communities of practice around different topics. Way, way too complicated, but getting closer to an actual representation of the way innovation works. Right? So what we're trying to do in, in D.C. is uh, talk about how do we change this conversation, how do we come up with a new frame that isn't so complicated and mechanistic and somehow captures the real nature of innovation in a fairly direct but more accurate way. And that's why you hear a lot of talk in DC now about innovation <laughs> ecosystems, right? We want to build an ecosystem for innovation. So it's interesting to look at this from a linguistic perspective. What does an ecosystem suggest to you? Right? What are the features of an innovation ecosystem? Well, like an ecosystem, it's going to, in theory, evolve. It changes. As we know, innovation changes over time. Right? It tends to be organic. It's not directed by some higher authority necessarily. It's something that kind of grows from the bottom up. It consists of a lot of diverse participants, actors. If you look at a rainforest, all the different species that are interplaying and interacting with one another. And those species, those actors are symbiotic. Their relationship is interdependent, which is true of innovation. But there are lots of things where if you're in a company, if you invent something, you've got to work with the marketing people, the sales people, the finance people. You're dependent upon one another to make that innovation successful, right? But this also in indicates some level of complexity in this process, right? So a lot of ecosystems tend to be self-organizing. Again, all of these different participants kind of come together and come to this balance of symbiosis through some natural process of natural selection. 
um, which actually happens in economies as well. Uh, they tend to be self-regulating, so the balance of the ecosystem tends to be pretty stable by the nature of how that ecosystem has evolved and the environment is created. And this means that even though these ecosystems are adaptive, they can be sometimes fragile or sometimes resilient, right? If you have a robust ecosystem that adapts very well to change and you have a real exogenous shock like increase in oil prices or a war or famine, something like that, your ecosystem should be able to adapt and adjust to that shock. But in many cases, if critical elements of your ecosystem get compromised by this shock, the entire thing collapses catastrophically, which is very true of innovation systems as well, that you see a lot of innovation systems in companies and in entire nations that can actually be destroyed seemingly overnight um, just because of changes in the external environment. Um, I spend a lot of time working with Japan and the Japanese economy is one where there's still a lot of innovation there, but it really has been hindered by their um, economic circumstances for quite a while. And again, in the 1980s, we all thought Japan was going to take over the world. Okay. So why does this kind of matter when we're talking about innovation policy for energy? One is to uh, realize that there is no energy innovation that happens without other kinds of innovation as well. So this is the example of the Apple iPod. You can see that there's been a lot of investment that's been done, um, not just by private companies, but by federal agencies, DARPA, Department of Energy, uh, the, uh, the Army, into the basic technologies that eventually enabled the iPod to be assembled and come together and sold as a product. So this, again, relationship between all of the different kind of discoveries and inventions and innovations all come in together in the development of a new product or a new technology. So if we want to actually change the way innovation happens, there are a couple of ways we need to think about doing this. One is that we need, we need to think about facilitating this ecosystem. Right? Again, it's a complex process. There's a lot of uncertainty. How can we help reduce the uncertainty, get a little bit better reliability in the outputs and the outcomes of our innovation efforts? How do we accelerate innovation? How do we actually just make the time to market much faster? Because a lot of the time to market comes from inefficiencies in the process, in the system. So if we can wring out those inefficiencies, we can get more innovations in a shorter period of time. And we need to optimize the way we go about doing innovation. So if you look at any investment in R&D as a financial portfolio, you really have to think about the balance of your uh, different assets you're investing in, right? The, what's the portfolio composition? And how do we distribute the resources across all the different innovation options that we have to make sure that we reduce risk and come out with what we think is going to be the optimal outcome, right? You're never going to be 100% right. You're never going to be able to predict things with certainty. But if you can manage the portfolio well, you can manage the risk and make the overall outcome uh, more reliable and, again, more robust. So when it comes to looking at energy innovation, uh, what we're trying to do is really take a look, step back and take a look at what do we mean when we look at the nature of technological change in energy. And in the case of this Department of Energy project, we're looking specifically at, at photovoltaic uh, technology. But really, when you try to think about what is the nature of a, of a technological breakthrough, you know, we tend to use these terms like, oh, well, there's an emerging technology that's going to disrupt the market, right? This, this, this new innovation. But we never really know what you mean when you say, well, what, when does something really emerge, right? Now, what, what date and time would you say that, you know, the, um, the, the smartphone emerged in the economy? There's no way to really define that very well. Um, we know that... You know, maybe there was stuff going on before that emergence happened. Well, what was the nature of that? Did that contribute to this emergence process? Um, what causes some things to emerge and, and other things seem to emerge and then they suddenly die out and they never catch on, right? Technologies like Betamax or science fields and like cold fusion, things like that. Um, and, and are there things where, is there a dynamic where things stop being emergent at some point? Right? We have all these questions that we never really bother to try to define and answer very precisely. And in evolutionary economics, we're trying to come up with some language and concepts and constructs to look at this. So look at things like punctuated equilibria, that innovation happens in spurts, and then you have kind of a, a, a stabilizing process, and then you have another disruption. Uh, you have path dependence, that the decisions I make today change the options I can take tomorrow in how to develop new innovation. Um, that you often have in any technological system competing technologies that act in a kind of natural selection process where some technologies become dominant and others don't, and often for reasons not related to their performance, but related to things like, again, economic value or commercial interests or things like that. 
So trying to realize what goes into a breakthrough will help us understand how to make those breakthroughs happen more frequently. You know, these breakthroughs tend to be very obvious in retrospect, but really in advance we don't know what is going to be the next breakthrough at any given point in time. So we need to look at how to make those opportunities happen more frequently and more efficiently. Now in photovoltaic, we have this cost curve that's been observed where the cost of the performance or the, the outputs, the power from photovoltaic cells has decreased actually pretty precipitously over the last uh, 30 years. It's been a very, very clear downward trend and, and very fast compared to other energy technologies, uh, I might add. So it looks in the aggregate like kind of a smooth process of improvement, but we know that kind of underneath the hood, there are a lot of inventions, there are a lot of innovations, there are a lot of technologies that are all contributing to each time we take a step down this cost curve, right? So we want to know how, do, how does any group or set of particular breakthroughs contribute to progress along this curve? Right? How do we bend the curve because of specific types of things that have happened in the innovation space? And then how do we also look at those breakthroughs in the, in this, in the context of the fact that we have alternate types of photovoltaic technology and sometimes the balance of power or the contribution of this cost curve might be shifting based on which photovoltaic technology is being developed more, um, uh, more quickly or, or more heavily at, at any given point in time. So the National Renewable Energy Labs has put out this chart that actually shows what is the best reported performance of different um, photovoltaic technologies. So each colored curve is a different kind of technology, as you can see in this legend in the upper left-hand corner. And these technologies have different parameters in terms of performance and also in terms of cost. So at the top, the best performing ones are multi-junction modules, which are highly performing because they were mostly funded by the Defense Department and NASA for solar panels for things like satellites, where you need high performance, but they don't care about the cost. So they tend to be very costly to produce. Some of the stuff very much lower on the cost curve may actually be, uh, uh, the performance curve may actually also be lower cost, and therefore for commercial purposes might be more attractive for kind of getting to mass market solar. So we're trying to look at all of these inflection points in these curves, right? It seems like in a lot of these, you'll see this recurring pattern of there's a jump in the performance and then a leveling off and then another jump and then a leveling off, right? So what is causing these inflections? What, what's going on around those times when those innovations or those developments occur? And can we look at the patterns, if there are any, that are found in looking at those breakthroughs and from those patterns, can we discern lessons that we can apply to the future of photovoltaic development, again, to make sure that we have similar breakthroughs happening more frequently, more reliably, and also with, with greater um, effect. So that's kind of the point of my current research project with, with the department. And a lot of what we know about breakthroughs is that they tend to be the result of actually not new concepts. Um, you know, there's a saying, there's nothing new, oops, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just the recombination of old concepts, but in very new contexts. You know, new, new, old wine in a new bottle. So what, one reason why we're very interested in things like interdisciplinary research or the convergence of different technology domains is that we tend to see these breakthroughs, these inflection points occur when domains that seem to be unrelated to one another are brought together by a, a, an entity or a person or a technology. Um, you know, one example that I've looked at uh, in, in a case study was the idea of sociogenomics, you know, that your gene structure influences your social behavior. It was actually first developed by an entomologist who was studying honeybee populations and wanted to know why do some bees become drones and others become worker bees. And he thought it had something to do with brain chemistry and then thought, well, maybe I should do some genomics work and look at that. And he basically combined genomics analysis and social science and sociology in a new field by taking those two concepts and mashing them together. So if we can kind of look at that process in a more precise and granular way, we might get some better insights about the nature of innovation and apply that to, to energy technologies. So one other aspect of the project I'm working on is we're really trying to look at a new methodology for investigating this, um, this kind of thing. And it's called critical event um, tracing, um, but using uh, computational methods of text analytics. So uh, critical event tracing is a, uh, a field that has a long history. Uh, this is actually one of the first reports on that topic that was written in the late 60s. It's called Traces. Um, and it looked at a number of different technologies. And the NSF was trying to figure out, well, 
what is it that came together to make these technologies? It was things like the birth control pill and uh, videotape recorders and, and concepts like that. The research team spent a lot of time and, and over a year putting this report together on just six technologies. And the problem is that that's pretty much where we are today when we want to do similar studies. A lot of the studies are done by, you know, we have to interview the people who are involved in that research field, you know, people who are inventors, people who are kind of the, the key scientists, talk to them about what they did, how did they get there, what things were they looking at when they came up with that idea, maybe have some archival research if it's available, but often there wasn't a lot of documentation involved that was uh, easily accessible. Um, and so this becomes very time consuming, it's labor intensive, it takes a long time, so we can't really get a lot of observations of these breakthroughs because it would just be too resource intensive. So what if we could at least try to somewhat automate this process and be able to look at a lot of instances of breakthroughs in a shorter period of time by using uh, methods that, uh, of text analytics. So this is what we're doing right now. This is again the, the, the chart from the old traces study and it's looking at all of the different technology trajectories and components that went into the videotape recorder. You see that there was magnetic uh, materials work, there was a lot of on electronics, you know, kind of the signal processing side, and all of these different triangles and circles are different critical events in the development of all the inputs to the videotape uh, recorder. So what if we could actually start looking and discovering those circles and triangles and boxes automatically by looking at um, literature? Right? Because we know that all these breakthroughs are generally occurring as an interplay between a lot of different kinds of progress being done in different fields, in different technologies, in different research domains. So if we kind of look at progress overall occurring along these S-curves, you'll have instances where we are moving up the S-curve and getting to a better you know, uh, performance from an existing technology, and then suddenly a new technology will come along and we'll jump to that and then that will become the dominant technology. This is the essence of the disruptive technologies that um, Clay Christensen talks about, right? The fact that the new technology looks inferior at the beginning, but uh, quickly when people start switching over to it, it develops more rapidly and surpasses the original technology. Um, so how do we actually track this kind of a dynamic in, in the real world? Um, and in particular, we think that digital scientific communication that we have today, the fact that so much science and technology is being developed with electronic communication as a medium, right? Publications, patents, working papers, technical documents, right? We can actually mine that documentation and actually look at this at a granular level with an automated system. So uh, this is a very rough model of how science actually occurs. And you'll see that what we've done is broken it down into kind of classes of entities. So each color here represents a different class of entity. So blue are institutions, purple are kind of social structures like communities and disciplines uh, or, or networks. Um, red are artifacts that we can look at, instruments, labs, documents, right? And then green are linguistic kind of entities, terms and communication modes, right? So we're looking specifically at uh, publications, scientific articles right now, and journals and patents. Uh, and we're trying, going to try and expand that somewhat, but try and see if we can come up with you know, observations about the social patterns that were involved in the development of innovations um, just by looking at the text of what the different people involved were writing at the time of that innovation. Okay. So what we're trying to do then is take all of these documents in any given domain and distill it into some kind of a repeatable model of how we can describe the nature of that breakthrough. So really what we need to do here is take a lot of different kinds of documents that are describing different aspects of a field. So that could be papers or technical reports or you know, uh, federal uh, award grants and that kind of thing. We're going to use a suite of computational tools drawn from natural language processing, topic modeling, and topic clustering. Uh, a lot of network analysis to look at relationships among documents and among the researchers themselves. And really try to marry that with a systems view of how technological progress occurs. So look at all of these things in the context of what was the policy about energy at the time? How, what was being done to accelerate the diffusion of ideas? How did those ideas disseminate throughout the community? Um, and, and look at this idea of how do we actually create essentially a grammar for describing scientific and technological progress? 
right? If you look at any field of science, you basically have, for example, in a scientific paper, you'll have a description of, well, what am I studying, right? the phenomenon? What's my methodology? What instruments am I using? What theories am I basing my, my, my hypothesis on and, and, and generating my hypotheses? And then what are my experimental results and then implications? So these are all cues that we can use and look at over and over again in different instances to try to figure out, well, how did each breakthrough happen? What was kind of distinct and, uh, and unique about it? And what was, uh, in fact, a, a common pattern that we can look at? And we can use this to describe inventions and other forms of, of technological development as well. And so having this, this grammar, this, this, this kind of grammatical or linguistic structure of how innovation and discovery occurs is really a very useful tool in then coming up with this way of mass producing case studies of breakthroughs. Okay. Uh, and this, I, I'll mention that you, know, you still need to have a human analyst looking at this to really figure out what the meaning is. We don't have the ability right now to automatically say, here's the answer. But uh, you know, a person can actually look at all of the outputs and start to think about, OK, how does this all start to fit together? Okay. So just to give you an idea of some of these computational methods, this is a, a topic modeling uh, project that was done by um, uh, someone who is, I've worked with, Dr. David Newman. At, uh, well, he was at UC Irvine. He just got hired by Google, like everyone else in this field. Um, so he actually modeled, uh, did a topic model across all of the grants from this National Institute for General Medical Sciences, which is the NIH's really fundamental basic research uh, arm, and tried to figure out by looking at the award abstracts and the application abstracts, well, what were people funding at, NI at NIGMS, and what were the scientists doing with that funding, and how does it all relate to one another? So we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of grants over an extended period of time. Any one person couldn't possibly try and capture all that information from those documents and distill it into any sensible kind of output. So with topic modeling, he's able to actually uh, classify each award by what is the general topic, uh, scientific topic of that award, looking at just the nature of the language itself. And now we actually have a model for the portfolio of this institute, which is what's, I think, really critically important. What are they investing in? Which areas are they investing heavily in versus maybe underinvesting? How has the balance shifted over time? Questions like that, which are extremely important to managing innovation and research. Now we're able to get a better empirical view of how that actually works. Uh, a project that I've been working on right now is actually taking a similar uh, data set, which is grant awards from the National Science Foundation, and just trying to figure out of all the scientific awards, how do you classify those awards by their scientific discipline? Because right? if we want to look at interdisciplinary research and the, the combination of concepts from different domains, if we think that's an important sign of breakthrough, well, you need to know what is a discipline first, and how do things relate to one another. So essentially what we're doing is create a language model for physics, for chemistry, for math, for mechanical engineering, based on some set of text. And then we then cluster all of these grant abstracts based on how similar they are to this text, to the, the text of the disciplines, and then we tag the grant by the similarity to, you know, it's similar to physics and chemistry and material science maybe, right? And so this basically allows you to create these clusters of grants and topics. So this um, interface is a little kludgy, but it uh, shows you the, the hot spots here are where the columns, which are clusters of grants, line up with rows, which are topic areas. And so I've highlighted this one particular you know, square cell in this grid where you've got a grant that's clustered in there that talks about a collaborative experiment at Fermi Lab, you know, targeting this element, blah, blah, blah. What's interesting about this uh, methodology is the grant abstract only mentions the word physics once, but it clearly identifies it as a physics uh, topic because all of the other words associated with that grant abstract all are physics types of language. And in particular, they're words that occur together in a physics type of project description. Right? So the great thing about topic co-clustering in this method is that you're able to actually take any set of terms and figure out, well, the actual co-occurrence of these particular terms is indicative of a certain pattern that we can associate with you know, descriptions of experiments in this discipline. And then we can actually look at the source abstract and validate and see that, in fact, yes, this is a physics experiment because we know Fermi Labs does physics, right? And the, the key thing here is that we're able to process many thousands of grant abstracts in a very short period of time and figure out, again, 
how do we do this tagging? And then that gives the National Science Foundation a better idea of how is it spreading its investments across disciplines. And this is critically important in some place like NSF, which funds work in biology and computer science. And often the biology group is actually funding chemistry, and the chemistry group is funding biology, and they don't even know it. Right? So this is helping us with those kinds of analysis. So essentially what we're doing is taking documents as a, as a form of you know, big data and trying to figure out meaning from all of this information that's contained in all these documents. Now, in the process of doing this, we've actually discovered there are some things you need to keep in mind when you're doing this kind of a, an analytical approach. Um, first of all, there are clearly advantages to using this kind of methodology as investigation for innovation. First is that, again, you know, you're able to summarize and process huge amounts of documents that no individual would ever be able to review. Um, you're actually able to automate the detection of the concepts described and the context in which they are described. So context is often very critical for understanding the, the significance of a new concept. Where did that concept first get mentioned? Who was mentioning it? What were they talking about at the time? Anytime you see something new come up, you need to pay attention to the context to figure out if this, is this something that really is significant or is it maybe just something that's going to be uh, you know, a flash in the pan or a temporary uh, a kind of an of a anomaly. Um, and what these text analytics tool, analytical tools do is that it either gives you a better broad picture of the landscape than you could do yourself, or at the very least, it can take all of the information and put it in a visualization that's easier for humans to then process and cognitively deal with. Right? So even though you may not be coming up with a clear answer per se, you're putting things in a certain kind of a display or a certain kind of presentation that then a human decision maker can use that and say, okay, now I understand what's going on here and, and act accordingly. So there are, there are some problems in this uh, kind of uh, analysis. First is that you actually need to have the right kind of data set. So we found that, you know, obviously you want to have a very large data set of documents if possible to have the broadest kind of language set. Um, it works often best if you have some kind of document structure, like a scientific article, although it does work on unstructured documents as well. Um, what you're doing is you're, you're discerning this meaning from correlation analysis. Essentially. What are patterns that we observe? Are these patterns important? And, and why do these patterns happen the way they, they happen? Why, are they, why do these things happen to be unnatural, right? And you're able to use small amounts of kind of labeled data. If you analyze small numbers of documents first, figure out you know, how do they work within your framework, then you can kind of let your algorithm loose on the broader data set, and it can use what it knows from the observations you've made, and then use that to do classification across the, the larger set of documents. Um, the problem then is that you have this traditional, you know, conventional garbage in, garbage out, right? If your labeled data is terrible, your results are going to be terrible. So if you have a human uh, or somebody else who is an experienced person trying to, say, tag this small set of documents or describe it initially, that person needs to have some domain knowledge and be able to actually do that description accurately so that that gives the algorithm enough cues to then function and actually do the right kinds of uh, correlation analysis. Right? Um, and I argue vociferously with my computer science colleagues the other problem that we have is that there's a big temptation to just do the brute force, right? I'm going to throw these documents into an algorithm. It's going to spit out all these neat patterns, and the patterns are, you know, my discoveries, right? The problem we have with correlation analysis is that correlation is not causation, as we all get told in PhD programs. So just seeing the pattern may not actually tell you what you need to know to make a decision. And in fact, in a lot of cases, because the pattern may be a particular artifact of the document set, unless you have the right kind of sample of documents, if you're trying to describe a larger domain, you may come up with patterns that aren't exactly true in the real natural universe. And again, what we find with brute force models is they are reliable to a point until the underlying assumptions that they're based on, uh, often without our really realizing it, when those assumptions change in the natural environment, and then the model will break and it will break ca catastrophically. So if you don't have some kind of a model or framework in mind when you're analyzing this data set and trying to ma marry the text analytics to that framework, you're going to actually probably run into a lot of trouble. Or you might just get you know, results that really aren't that useful. And so this really 
for me, it drives home the point that you know, the, the analytics are not going to make the decisions for you. They're not going to make the discoveries for you. You still need to be able to look at this as a, you know, from an analytical and an integrative point of view to figure out what the meaning is. But the great advantage is that you can make those decisions and you can make those observations and, and conclusions much more rapidly and in a much more informed matter, manner than if you didn't have this kind of technique. So it does show that we have a lot of promise here in using text analytics. Uh, I'm always a little cautious to say that, you know, well, if we go too far in this direction and think that the tool is going to produce everything we need, um, then we will often come up to, with, with bad decisions. Um, but I think the judicious marrying of a theoretical and a model-driven approach with an analytics tool can be a much more, uh, a very powerful combination. And that was all I had, so thank you very much. So I think we have 15, 20 minutes at least uh, for questions, so. Yes, and if you have a question, raise your hand. The class is marked mic around the recording the event as well, so you want your questions to be asked on the mic. Um, one question. Um, how does it go across different languages and publications and stuff like that? Um, so in, a, in another research project, we're doing the same kind of technique to analyze um, scientific publications in Chinese and Korean and a couple of other languages. Um, the issue we have, the, the machine translation is very good. The problem that you run into, and this is again an, a, a, a caution, is that the way that different cultures use language in science actually is different. So for example, I did a lot of work in Japan. A Japanese scientific article is actually written very differently from a traditional English language article just because of the nature of their style of communication and the, the conventions by which they communicate. And this is true of actually any Japanese writing, if you look at it, it's structurally very different in many ways from what you see here in the United States. So unless you have a way of kind of accounting for that in your model and in your analytics and kind of, again, teaching your tool that when terms appear in this order in English and they appear backward in the reverse order in French, you know, well, the problem is that the French adjective follows the noun, so that's why it's, you know, those are actually the same thing. Um, so those kinds of things uh, are the areas that we're trying to work on. Yeah, it's a very high level, not technical question. I was wondering, like, um, is there a good way to fund, to, to think about how to fund, like, really long range research efficiently? So, for example, uh, a research project where you, it might look like just on the surface that there's no practical application, but it could have value in the marketplace many, many years from now. Are there people thinking about are there people thinking about how to use market forces to, to be efficient about how we allocate funds for these really long-range research projects? Um, there, are, there are people looking at that, and um, we, we are not very good at it, <laughs> um, even describing it. Uh, I mean, a lot of this issue comes around, again, the nature of the uncertainty of how research develops and how you get results out of very fundamental research. So what we do know is that, you know, because there's so much uncertainty about how a particular basic research discovery leads to a development. And actually, the, the iPod example is a great one because it mentions that one of the key inventions that led to signal processing for the iPod was the fast Fourier transform, which is just a math problem, right? It was a mathematical routine, which on the surface probably didn't think, people didn't think too much of it at first, but you know, obviously was a very powerful tool for doing all kinds of computation for real purposes. Um, so the, the, the argument really is at this point kind of you want to have a diverse portfolio, you want to look at a lot of different ideas. Um, often the craziest ideas are the ones that end up with the highest payoff. So don't rule out things that are that seem on the surface to be unreasonable. Um, but it really is a matter of how do you maintain the right kind of balance so that you can create an environment where, again, ideas are going to collide, right? You want to have a diverse portfolio of ideas and set up an environment where more and more collisions are likely to occur, and that's where you tend to see those basic research discoveries being turned into actual applications. Another question. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that the whole f process of how research becomes commercialization. Is there any coupling of this model that you just showed with what kinds of results come out at the tail end? 
Um, we're getting to that point. So right now we're really focused on kind of the front end of, and part of that's a limitation of the documents we're using. You know, we're using scientific articles and patents, which are really, really input indicators still, right? They're ideas and inventions that are far from usually the marketplace. So we're trying to figure out how we then link those indicators to market forces, um, probably by expanding it. Uh, we're going to try and expand the, the data set into things like trade publication articles or, you know, business news and things like that. Um, so we're hoping that in, through other kinds of projects, we can actually start to look at, okay, when we see this kind of thing occurring in the basic science literature, and then we know that those actors are talking to these actors and they end up doing this, we can start to get a better map of that process. But I think that that's still pretty far away, to be honest. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I read an interesting book a few months ago <clears throat> and many good points in it, but one of the things that I did find questionable was an assertion that innovation is slowing down. And, and one of the metrics in the book was patent disclosures or patent filings and such and not. And I thought that was odd. In my view, we see more intelligent people in the world joining the, the global knowledge base. <clears throat> we have much lower barriers to communication globally. We have more of a common language, sort of the TCP IP of that is English language. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, tools, you know, compute power that helps. So what's your view about innovation is it slowing down or speeding up, or is that just by segment or particular areas that it may slow down or speed up? What's your view? Um, I think the problem we have is that, again, we don't have good metrics, and most of the metrics we have are like patents. Again, they're inputs. And patent rates vary dramatically by circumstances that are not related to the actual innovation, like, you know, people are getting smarter about only filing for patents or things that are worth patenting, and so their patenting rate goes down. That doesn't mean they're less innovative. It just means that they're more strategic about the innovation they do, right? Um, in biomedical and pharmaceuticals, there is a clear slowdown in innovation because new molecule entity filings at the FDA have dramatically decreased over time despite increases in R&D spending. So we know that the kinds of things that people think are going to be useful drugs are becoming less and less frequent. And a lot of that's just due to the fact that the cost of Developing a drug, taking it all the way through clinical trials, and the risk involved, and then marketing it is so huge that, again, companies are just taking fewer and fewer bets because the possible downside financial consequences are much higher. Um, so I think in certain areas like that, I think in, in things like IT, I've seen people claim that IT innovation is slowing down. I think that that's really kind of a garbage conclusion to come to because you're not looking at the right signals. Um, and I think that especially with IT, the, one of the interesting things is that the the instruments and the tools are so cheap now, I and mean, the amount of processing I can do on a desktop computer is like, you know, a supercomputer 20 years ago. So the availability of the raw inputs, uh, like instrumentation, are, are, are much broader and, and much easier. So um, I, I don't know if, I don't think there's any way right now to actually even answer the question is if innovation is slowing down or speeding up, um, and, except in very limited circumstances. And anybody who thinks they can measure that is probably not telling the truth. There's some questions in the back, I think, or? So back to the, uh, the beginning of your, your presentation um, where you were on, on Washington. Uh, in your opinion, um, what do you think can be done uh, so that policymakers, whether it be legislators, regulators, administrators, are crafting public policy uh, that is conducive to innovation? Um, you know, it, it really comes down to telling a better story and figuring out what that story really is. Um, the, the pipeline story it really is a, is a modern invention. It really came about after World War II, and it was basically the story about penicillin and, you know, synthetic rubber and, um, you know, radar that came out of wartime research uh, then becoming, you know, commercially uh, valuable. Um, which was a true story at the time, and it probably was a good guide for policy in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s. Um, I think a lot of the problem is that the nature of innovation has changed, the environment has changed, it's much more organic like an ecosystem, and we just don't have a very good way of describing that process in a kind of a crystallized fashion. Uh, a friend of mine who was worked in the White House for quite a while in science policy, he has a saying that, you know, 
Every, if you want to sell something in Washington, it has to be a bumper sticker. Right? If, it, if it sits on a bumper sticker, then Congress will take it. But if, it's more, if you need more than a bumper sticker to explain your idea, then you're, you're never going to get it sold. So I think it's just a matter of how do we figure out what's really going on and, and distill it into some kind of a better metaphor. And there's actually a, a panel at the National Academy of Sciences that's taking this issue on directly. That's that their charge is to think about what is a new way of framing uh, the nature of research and its economic benefits and giving that to policymakers. Um, and I've been in some of their meetings, and I think they're still kind of flailing around trying to figure that out. Back here. Thanks. Uh, this kind of makes me think of uh, Asimov's psychohistory a little bit. And if you can get your inputs accurate enough, you could actually be able to have some predictive ability about points of convergence between technologies or, or innovations or whatever else. And do you see that as an eventual goal? Do you see that as a, as a potential possibility that you can even move towards, you know, discovering a point of convergence before it happens so that you can get everyone in the room and say, hey, you, all of your research is tying together to figure out how to make a product out of it. Or um, I think that you can, again, my, my whole kind of like finance theory point of view is you can increase, you can decrease uncertainty and you can manage the risk, but the uncertainty and risk are, are never going to go away. So you can have predictive power that is more robust than we have today, but it will never be really that accurate. But there's already been pretty good results in, for example, um, technology strategy by looking at patent filings and actually identifying technology holes. And actually topic uh, analysis and text analytics is great for this. It's like, you know, people are talking about this here and this here and they're putting these things together here and these things together here. Why is it that nobody's putting this together with this? Well, let's try it and see what happens, right? So you can actually, again, identify those opportunities to combine and integrate concepts. Doesn't mean that the opportunity is going to pay off even if you're successful in the combination, um, but at least it gives you a better idea about, again, where can I selectively invest my resources in the most promising sets of opportunities and then arbitrage across them to get a better you know, overall outcome. So I think that is possible. So how would you measure innovation then? What are some of the other things besides patent, patents granted? Well, I think that um, you know, what areas that we have metrics for but not data are things like new product introductions, um, looking at, um, again, what were the inputs to those new products, uh, looking at the market growth for new products based on different technologies. I think that there, there is, again, a linkage from scientific concept to development of technologies to you know, market impact and economic impact. Um, sometimes it's reverse, like, you know, new instrument technologies, like, you know, new medical um, uh, scanners develop, come up and give us new scientific concepts, right? But I think that if you have data points uh, at each of those kind of key junctions, then you can get a better way of measuring, okay, for this given set of inputs in research and technology, we get these outputs. I think the problem is that a lot of that data is either not being captured or else it's proprietary, um, or else, in some cases, it may be just kind of too hard to capture. So. And what's the term in economics when they're looking at CPI? They have some device for equalizing or normalizing the improvement in quality, not just quantity. Yeah. How do you take into account that? I forgot what the term is. Um, so I, 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 is it know, an H, I think? Um, I'm not familiar with the technical term. I've looked at this a little bit. I mean, they're doing this thing with, like, chain link prices, so they look at kind of price and... Well, there are a couple of different ways you can look at it. There, there, there are people who are looking at things like consumer benefit, which is not captured in prices, right? So price drops are a measure of improvement, but also because consumers can do more with the technology, we need to have a way of capturing that. Um, and some folks at MIT have looked at that for in the case of com computers, for example, and information technology. Um, and in the CPI, they do have some measures of this. In regulatory economics, which I've studied in telecom, they have a way of looking at this as well. But they're pretty crude, and they're usually basically modeled estimates based upon a fairly idealized set of assumptions. 
So I tend to be pretty skeptical about those because they tend to be like a lot of these economic multipliers you see mm -hmm. kind of being thrown around. A lot of them are the product of not really empirical data, but just, well, here's things that we think happen in the economy and relationships we think are going on. So we're going to build, you know, a multiplier and, and the coefficient based on that. So um, I don't think we really have great measurements. But I'd say it's not really my area of expertise either. So. Uh, Dr. Alexander, I, I was just um, wondering, you must be going through a massive amount of data, and while we're talking about and focusing on innovation, surely there must be many, many more failures within the scientific community. I was just uh, curious to see if you could comment on how that helps you contextualize your research and you know, what, what sort of information that provides you on the nature of innovation itself. Uh, you mean looking at the failures as well as the successes? Um, actually, if, so this is really interesting. Um, so a couple of things we've discovered in, in several of these projects. One is that bad ideas in science almost never die. They just get relabeled, right? And there are a lot of failed ideas that get relabeled and then become actually good ideas. And actually there was a guy on um, John Stewart last night, this um, astrophysicist, talking about uh, scientific blunders, that, you know, mistakes that like, you know, Einstein made, that, and Einstein realized he blew it, and then 30 years later, it turns out that what he thought was a mistake was actually true, right? <laughs> so there's all these issues of these serendipitous kind of, or kind of almost ra seemingly random cases of failures that actually turn out to be successes later on. Um, I think a lot of what's interesting is to, to look at, you know, what failures, how failures sometimes become successes, and what's the process of that. And one of my personal areas of interest, which I can't really research right now, but I'm trying to figure out how, is, um, how do you actually find, how do you calculate the value of different failures? So there are failures that you learn from that are instructive and therefore turn into economic value versus mistakes you just keep doing over and over again because you don't really figure out what you're doing and that's kind of completely lost you know, value there, right? And I, I, I come at this because from you know, the Silicon Valley point of view, there's a saying like, oh, well, you should always be prepared to fail and people who fail often, you know, you, Learn to fail early and fail often. It's like, well, if you fail often, at a certain point, maybe you're just failing, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, and in fact, it was funny that I was at a talk by the former director of DARPA, you know, and she was asked, um, well, I hear that DARPA is an agency where you encourage failure, you know, and that's why you're so, you know, able to do these great things. She's like, we don't encourage people to fail, <laughs> but we do make people more tolerant of failure so that they're able to take more risks in their research and in their projects, right? So I think those kinds of distinctions about the nature of failures in, in a more granular fashion, and especially how do we learn from them and use those to um, direct re f further research is, is very valuable. Um, actually, one of a, a program manager we've worked with at SRI, we presented a, a research project uh, at, the, at a progress report where we said, oh, we, we tried this and it, we've determined really it doesn't work. People have looked at it and we figured out there's just no way that this is gonna work. And the program manager said, that's fantastic. So now I don't have to waste my money on trying that over and over again. I can do, I can put it and do something else, right? So I think those are the kinds of things where it's very, very helpful. Thank you, sir. Let's take one more question here. You have one. Right, so we have one final question here. Um, just to return for a second to the policy space, um, over the past couple of months, a new Secretary of Energy has talked about reevaluating, potentially reshaping the relationship the department has with the national labs. And since we're talking about government funded research, do you have any suggestions for how that relationship could be improved to help the, I guess, the innovation pipeline for lack of a better paradigm to use? And then sort of to improve uh, the connection between basic research and commercialization in terms of government funded research? Sure. Um, I can throw some just random comments out there because it's not something I'm really highly qualified to talk about, but I've been in, in D.C. for, again, about 25 years, and there have been at least three or four of these, basically, oh, let's look at the national labs and figure out why they don't work the way they're supposed to. Um, again, at a certain point, I kind of wonder, well, maybe they are working the way they're designed to, and they're just bad, really badly designed. <laughs> and some of the studies I've seen do seem to suggest that. I think there's, there's, a, there's a problem of um, the the nature of the incentives that labs are given because they tend to have a base set of funding and then they have to compete for additional funding to finish their work. And so there's a lot of, actually as a, my, my boss who actually was the director of the laboratory operations board at 
the Department of Energy a while ago says, national labs are seen as being very slow, but they are really quick when there's money involved. <laughs> so it's a matter of figuring out how do you align the incentives in a better and more practical manner to get, to get better reforms. I, I think there is a fundamental problem of disconnect of trying to get basic science institutes to figure out how to translate their findings into practical outcomes. And um, at SRI, we actually have a kind of a methodology where we're, because you know, what we try and do is make everything about practical outcomes, and, and we still want to do curiosity-driven science, but with some eye on, you know, there's going to be a point to this at some you know, level. Um, and there's, there's a way you can actually structure a management method of you know, what my CEO calls, don't just look at the interesting questions, but the important ones as well. Right? So how do you focus scientists' attention on things that are scientifically interesting and curiosity-driven, but still you can kind of start to think about, okay, I can kind of see where this is going. I, I think there's still obviously going to be a role for pure basic research that has no application. I mean, astrophysics might fall in this category or you know, some, some other types of science that look like they have no real value, but they expand human knowledge. But I think if you're talking about a federal government investment where you're, you have a, the taxpayers have a reasonable expectation of getting a return on investment sometime, um, having the incentive structure to direct that research effort towards things that have some hope of you know, an application and, and, and social benefit is certainly worth doing. And, and there are ways to do it, and uh, the national labs just really aren't set up to implement them right now. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Thank you.